it's Monday evening uh, at an early time. It's Graphic Policy Radio, where comics and politics meet. I'm your host, Ivana Levin, a.k.a. Ivana Brooklyn. And um, today we have the writer and artist of a brand new original graphic novel joining us on the show, Michelle Perez and Rami Budo. Um, Image Comics presents a surprisingly honest and touching account of a trans girl surviving through sex work in Seattle. The Pervert is an unflinching debut graphic novel that is preoccupied with work what we put into our work, and what it takes from us. Continuing the narrative begun in the Eisner-nominated comics magazine Island, which we actually talked about when it first launched a couple years ago, uh, The Pervert uh, features Painted Colors by Remy Boydell and the writing debut of Michelle Perez. I want to thank you for joining us. Hi, Michelle. Hi. Hello, Michelle. (laughs) Hi. Sorry about that. Um, How's it going? uh, Well, better now that I figured out what was going on. (laughs) Um, hopefully Remy will still be able to join us. Uh, I, I will, when I, when I, when I see Remy in the queue, I will put them through. Um, so I guess I just want to get started talking with you a little bit about, um, how the graphic novel came to be. Uh, I know that you began writing it, um, in Island Comics Anthology, but, uh, how did, how did you sort of come into making comics as an art form in the first place? Um, I, I think the earliest form was uh, there was a message board I used to frequent, uh, and I check every now and again, but they have these artists' uh, showdown things, right? Mm-hmm. So the basic premise is you're going to draw your original character, and then another person is going to draw their original character, and then they vote for who did the best comic in a sort of Final Four bracket style. Uh, a kid I was friends with basically wanted some help because he wasn't really great at writing. And I said, okay, I'll take a crack at it. And uh, I've been doing things uh, sort of on a DIY grassroots approach uh, ever since, either meeting up with people via social media or just friends I knew on the West Coast and uh, how I I kind of came into it and how I met Remy through a mutual friend we have. Hmm. Do they still do those sort of um, competitions, I guess, or? Uh, If there are artist boards out there, I, I suspect they, they, do that or do some modified variation on it. Maybe it's less combat oriented and more like, (laughs) I don't know, here's us setting the scene. Here's, here's how these two characters interact. And I mean, this is all speculation. Maybe, maybe that, maybe that shit's dead. I I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. There's so many interesting phases in sort of the comics and art background community. And it's sometimes it's just like, Oh no, that's not a thing anymore. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually hadn't heard about those, but that's really cool. And what what initially attracted you to comics as a medium? Uh, for a long time, i i had a I had a weird and sort of stilted introduction to comics. I used to work at the library when I was in high school, and there was this copy of The Watchmen, and you know. People say that's not like what you should start with, but I started with that. And so <laughs> I, I yeah. went from Watchmen and then started going through Mark Miller's Ultimate X-Men and then uh, Ultimate Spider-Man by Brian Michael Bendis and uh, Mark Bagley. And basically these were all of the... The ultimate line originally was like, okay, if all you've been exposed to is the movies, this is going to be the easiest gateway drug for you, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So it, it was. Uh, it was it was simple. The stuff was fun. Uh, you you had like, I guess Samuel Jackson as Nick Fury, <laughs> that they were just sort of not really being subtle about that and uh, yeah. Yeah, it was very appealing, and I kind of, you know, the older I grew, uh, the more my tastes refined, and I, you know, for a solid, like, 
five years, I was just really into Warren Ellis. It's not not a bad career to be the, obsessed with. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I read I read Transmit as a teenager, and basically it was like before that all I had read was young adult fiction like uh, like Ender's Game, and then uh, I was really into Ayn Rand. So like <laughs> in a weird way, Warren Ellis's work sort of sort of saved me from being a libertarian crypto fascist jackass. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I all all praise is due to him on that front. Art can do that. You know, that is not the only time I've I've heard I've heard that from from someone, you know. That's one of the reasons well, it matters. Yeah. <laughs> well, well yeah, uh, yeah. So no, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so it's interesting just because, um, you know, we, I do a lot of, I talk to a lot of queer comics creators, and we do a lot of coverage of queer comics, but I don't really do much with autobiographical comics or with slice of life comics. And this one is sort of more specifically under the slice of life piece of things. And, you know, I know for me, a lot of the time, it's not that I have anything artistically like, oh, I think this is the wrong medium to explore these topics with or anything like that. For me, a lot of the time, it's because, I usually found in the past a lot of those stories, like regardless of the teller, they'd be really depressing. And I like just have a, I have a hard time being sad. It's not a feeling I'm comfortable with. I'm way more comfortable with anger. And, you know, so I, it took me a second because I was like, Oh, this is definitely a slice of life comic, even though the characters are anthropomorphic. And I'm so glad that I began reading this. It was definitely your Twitter presence that got me to say, I'm going to give this a try. And this is one of those comics with like, you know, the whole, like I laughed, I cried thing. It, like it's real and it was completely worth it. And I just feel like a lot of the time when it comes to those personal narrative stories, like or something that might have the potential to make me feel sad, like what I get versus what I gave doesn't quite work out in a ratio that I like have the patience or emotional energy for. And your your comic like just completely did that for me. I absolutely laughed, I absolutely cried. I'm a true believer, totally worth it. So I wanna thank you for helping me break through that experience for one thing. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, I think, I think I I'm of the same mind in some aspects. Uh, mm-hmm. What, what when I usually go to any sort of entertainment or anything, I sort of take in. You know, I I want to control like I don't know what I get out of something. So. You know, a slasher movie isn't really going to be what I gravitate towards because it's like, all right, I'm really big into pattern recognition. And, you know, the structure of a slasher movie is about as dialed in a structure as you can get for a film. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the stuff that stands out is stuff that bucks existing trends. For me, uh, what I found was helpful when trying to experience different stuff for me was, uh, documentaries. Uh, hmm. so, so documentary films where the subject matter is, you know, it's, it's very dramatic, but it is anchored in our reality and depicts very real problems or triumphs people have like day to day. And, it can kind of get you out of your own head, which I try to, I try to apply, I guess, lessons I've learned from really good documentarians. Uh, I think there's one documentary that stuck with me the most. It was called Dark Days. I don't know if you ever heard of it. That sounds familiar. Basically, English guy notices some dudes crawling into this tunnel and finds a homeless encampment called Freedom Town in New York. And he lives with these people for a year and he uh, has them help him sort of film the, the, the experiences they go through. And so it's sort of the, the, the film near it, its end uh, basically gets attention from 
local, I guess, transit authority people, and, like, they sort of bleed into one another. And uh, I, I feel like for our comic where we're at right now, I feel like it was kind of the right place, right time uh, to do a comic with this subject matter because... Uh, you know, trans stuff is definitely something people see in the news. And, uh, with regard to my own experiences, I thought it would be a worthwhile narrative to do. And I don't know, I kind of wanted to take, take what I had learned over the years and sort of apply it to, uh, this It was originally going to just be anthology format. So I'm really mm. happy we got to do it graphic novel style. Oh, yeah, that's right, because you guys were initially in the Islands anthology. And um, how, how did you end up getting, uh, getting connected with Islands, and, like, what was that, what was that process like? Uh, I'd known Brandon Graham from uh, Twitter. We had mm-hmm. talked and spoke a lot and joked around and stuff, and Remy and him started talking, and, uh, you know, over time, we... We did uh, we did a thing in AVB and J Bear Hats uh, sort of online medium zine thing called the uh, Zeal. Uh, oh yeah. Or, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and we said, oh, all right, because uh, he was asking for submissions for Island, and he was definitely looking for trans perspectives and queer perspectives and he he'd even asked uh Amy at the time if she wanted to do a essay for it. I, I don't know if that ever came to pass, but uh yeah. So mm-hmm. we were we were just wrapping up like not getting uh an ongoing advice where it would basically center on this character and we were just like let's Let's try Island. Uh, it's probably going to be where we make the best uh, money on it, and we did. It was uh, probably the best uh, paying writing job I'd ever gotten. Yeah, that's a nice. special thing. There's not enough of there's not enough of that. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, what I mean, I think also another it's just sort of interesting confluence in terms of timing was this comic coming out like right as uh, a lot of the media coverage around um sesta which is the acronym for the stop enabling sex traffickers act which is a complete bullshit terrible legislation that i have very strong uh, opinion against because basically every single person that i know who has done sex work in their life has all pointed to this being a horrible piece of legislation um and so you had this this piece of legislation coming out with like lots of people talking out of their butt and not really knowing um, how this would actually criminalize and endanger actual people who are doing this work professionally in their lives. And then we also had a comic that was like actually showing the perspective of someone who is doing sex work and like, well, you know, how like it just is a job part of their life and things like that. It was sort of an interesting um, timing in terms of the conversation. I really think that, uh, I, I was like literally like seeing the press around this coming at the same time I was getting the like last ditch effort to like sign the petition, the stop SESTA kinds of stuff happening at the same time. Um, I mean, have you had, have you, have you guys been doing much sort of thinking about the connections between like how people have talked about the laws versus like your own experiences and as well as what you're representing in the art, which is not like, it's like not about it's like not an autobiographical piece, but it's influenced by experiences that you've had rather. But uh, I I think I think if there is any sort of editorial hand where uh, the book isn't as political as it could have been, uh, it kind of it kind of we had the focus on I guess. Uh, not telling the broadest narrative, but like the most accessible narrative for people across the board, which was mm-hmm. what made it a strong narrative. However, as it relates to my experience in my life, uh, I would say that uh, flat out uh, around that time, 
both the main character and me, uh, you know, did not use vetting services, but like I was under the impression that, yeah, I'm never going to, I'm never going to encounter any sort of violence and I can take care of myself and I'm this, and I'm that. And then, uh, you know, shit happens. And I, I, you know, I basically stopped at one point because shit got too real and I'm not going to go into all that, but what I'll Mm -hmm. say is that uh, the models that have been most successful for sex work and in general for what people put under this very big tentpole of uh, vice or red light activity, like be it hardcore drug use or whatever, the best model is always decriminalization and Mm -hmm. not being punitive when you give people a chance and you also allow people to live in relative safety, you'll find they contribute to society. You'll find that, uh, you'll have, you'll have less, less shit. Like, I don't know, X amount of sex workers dead uh, Mm or, and, for me, uh, I, I sort of look at where the book is right now and the groups of people that overlap. Uh, a great deal of trans people end up looking to sex work because in America, as well as many other places in the world, uh, there's still a great social stigma assigned. And uh, for some perspective, the largest single employer of trans people is the United States military. It's about a ballpark 15,000 people employed, uh, Mm -hmm. and that's the biggest single employer. So while, yes, there are about 1 million to probably 4 million ballpark trans people in America, and it's like half of 1% of all Americans overall. It is a minority. Uh, But still, that is... And it's such a a tiny pool. And so when we talk about SESTA and FOSTA, uh, it's not just affecting sex workers. It's also going to be involving trans people. And, uh, God, you know, I'm going to assume any veterans that find themselves out of work as per the weird-ass conditions, the... Yeah the current administration is trying to foist on them, you know, I mean, Lambda Legal did score a victory over them, but I sincerely doubt this is going to be the last time they take a crack at it. And you see that trans people are, are basically trying to be forced out of the public sphere and holding any sort of quote unquote respectable job. I, I don't think, I don't think, the sign of trans people being valid is necessarily being in the military. I don't think, (laughs) I don't think that, I don't think that bombing a wedding with a drone bomber and then bombing the subsequent funeral is going to be the way to trans liberation. I think (laughs) what is permissible in the public eye is what's going to be what dictates our norms and how people are treated. And yeah. I, 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 it's, it's some, it's really hard to be hopeful when you see uh, the people of this quote unquote blue wave or whatever the hell basically supporting shitty legislation like this. And you think how far is the Overton windows basically flown to one side where it's just going to be a bunch of Democrats that are essentially pushing uh, Republican issue policies that are, you know, they're supposedly, they're supposedly trying to be in favor of LGBTQ issues, but, you know, it, it seems like what they're saying, what they're doing are two very different things. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I really think that, like, you have a ton of, of people who don't know anything about the lived experience of the impact of communities going and just listening to what um, policy people who are actually not even coming from a good place in terms of their intent, like they're actually like crypto religious groups or groups of people that have actually have an anti-woman you know, agenda who are telling them to go and pass this bill in like super, you know, paternalistic ways. And then folks, rather than listening to like, you know, marginalized communities like sex workers uh, are still, they're just talking out of their, they're just talking out of, you know, out of like, and, ignoring what actual people are saying, thinking that uh, because it's complex, they're just going to make things easy and just, and, 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 you know, crack down on the uh, places that, that, you know, sex workers use to. And even then, uh, back, out, back page, you know? back yeah, page, for example, uh, they, they brought up, all right, we have this guy on X amount of, uh, what was it? It was uh, money laundering charges. And not once was this guy charged with human trafficking, which was the supposed yeah. reason that this this law was passed. So, I mean, there's 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 what they they purport to be in favor of, and then there's what's actually happening. And mm -hmm. I, it's not me acting like some Alex Jones esque. It's just that <laughs> yeah. these people, these people are fucking mercenaries. They they do not care. Uh, I mean, it's great to point to a Kamala Harris tweet or a Bernie Sanders tweet and say, "Wow, this person, this person's values are are really on point." But then you know, these people are just career oriented and oftentimes just switch the positions at the drop of a dime. I, I, like, like Kamala Harris was talking about, uh, what was it? She was talking about, you know, we have, we have this prison industrial complex. And I'm thinking, you're a fucking district attorney. <laughs> that's like, yeah, that's like, yeah. a, like yeah, I, I'm a police officer for fucking going on about the, the evils of this, this barbarous police treatment of people nowadays. It's just <laughs> awful. Also, yeah. I am the, the head cop of Cop Fort. It's, yeah. it's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, and what, and what I think is really special and powerful, you know, about the pervert is that you are, you know, telling a story of someone who's like just a, a, a regular person who's, you know, there's no, like, big, crazy, oh, I was kidnapped from my home and forced in this terrible, you know, thing. Like, the, the, you know, the, the main protagonist is someone who's showing, they're, it's not glamorizing, you know, like, oh, this is just a great and easy way to make a living. Like, no, like, you see how exhausting the emotional labor is. You see some of the dangers that people face, but it's, like, not sensationalized. It's, it's all told within the realm of, like, a normal sort of, you know, we all deal with exploitation at work. We all have bosses who are hypocritical, like one of the ones that, you know, we, we encounter in the, uh, in the story, you know, and it's sort of like, it, 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 it helps to have people who maybe don't know, who don't know that they know people who do sex work uh, or people who don't know that they may know people who are trans and just sort of show like this, these are, you know, these folks are living their lives basically. And it's not, the super crazy action movie that you think you're going to like rescue somebody from. Uh, well, yeah, that's the thing. Uh, the, the main, the main thing we wanted almost our mantra was that we did not want this to be a, uh, an after school special. And to that end, we also, we also made a character. It was a cam girl who had a pretty decent go at it because it's, a whole lot safer than being a full service sex worker. Uh, yeah. And the idea was that there's a whole range of experiences. And the thing I always uh, feel is important when we talk about uh, normalizing difference is that uh, I don't try to go for this. We're all the same inside and we all <laughs> bleed red but instead that, for the most part, 
outside of maybe specific people and groups of elites, everyone is fucking boring. Uh, everyone is boring. Uh, and a lot of the book is just minutia because we want the reader to kind of understand that for the most part, the, the, the character is just doing this for money and it's not like some sort of fall from grace, although the character contemplates what is different in this job versus another job, but it's, it's not something that it's, it's not the only problem that character has. And, you know, it's also just, it's, it's a narrative where I wanted to sort of have a documentarian feel because uh, the, the traditional heroes and villains and antagonists and et cetera, while entertaining uh, for this story, don't fit because the character is flawed. Uh, and if the character is based off of me, I do not want to show my best self because I'm going to be robbing you of a good story. It's, it's about, you know, a realized person. There's, you know, there's shitty, awful things that I have, yeah. you know, done to people or said or misspoke or, you know, the idea that you're going to only show yourself as this sympathetic uh, and sort of perfect version of yourself is, it's going to be, you know, you, you, do you want to see the Lifetime movie version of yourself or do you want to enjoy a decent story? Mm. That's, I, I, I kind of want people to relate. Uh, one of the things that people have talked to me most when they bring up the book was that there was this one really dumb argument that happened with the character in Portland. And for a lot of people that hit really close to home because uh, people have arguments like that and they have these complex issues with their relationships. And I wanted to show that instead of a bunch of, I don't know, montages where we, I don't know, sex scene, crying in bed, leather rinse for feet. Hmm. It would have been awful. It would have been really boring. Yeah, I mean, and that's definitely something this is absolutely not. Like when I opened up this, I was supposed, I was, I was at work, well, not at work. I, I work from home. I was, it was during work hours and I was not intending to read it all at one time, but I did because <laughs> I was completely sucked into the emotional reality of the story. I mean, I guess talking about like specificity of experiences, I thought that, you know, the decision that you guys had to do the characters as anthropomorphic animals was really interesting. Can, can you talk a little bit about that choice and, 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 and why you made that together? Well, uh, it was less of a together and more of a, I mean, the first time I actually wrote a script for Remy, I thought they were all going to be like humanoid. And I was surprised. It's like, wow, these all look like, uh, shall I say, very familiar characters. And she was like, yeah, uh, it's, it's just, it's just my thing. It's what I do. And it kind of taps into how Remy views nostalgia as a mm -hmm. lens with which we, we kind of look at ourselves and experiences we've had. Uh, sometimes I, I think, I think what attracted me to working with Remy was how she dealt with those images relative to trauma and also exploring ideas. Uh, and a familiar image can sort of be like this totemic link that makes it easier for you to, to look at that stuff and to work with that stuff. And, uh, the, the whole of this story is basically, uh, really, really deeply personal things where I'm kind of letting someone know way too much, but because I, I want, I want people to 
have a experience like they remember with the book. And so what Remy does is uh, kind of kind of use those sort of soft and welcome and familiar images to kind of make that experience uh, both less jarring and in some instances more jarring. Uh, mm. And I think, I think we, we hit a decent balance because uh, people, people, when they, they mention or speak about the book, phrase I hear most often is like being punched in the stomach uh, mm. almost verbatim like upwards of 10 times whenever anyone brings it up to me they're like it's cut I love the book but it's it hits me really hard and I was like oh, well I mean is this good question mark <laughs> yeah I mean, uh, certainly yeah it certainly was for me and like I said I oftentimes feel like that equation doesn't work out in the way that I feel was worth my emotional energy, but this absolutely, absolutely did. But it wasn't just because you also had moments that were funny, which like you do, but like you also have things that are just so like, I don't know, like romantic and in a very different way. Like I just, I, for example, I actually wrote this down when I was rereading this today. Um, Like when you're in the restaurant talking with the mouse girl and she just says like, let's cut our dicks in half with this knife. And it's like the most romantic, like, configuration of a statement that she could make in a diner in that moment. And I was like, Oh, my heart. Oh, that is so funny. That that is the reaction that one has. Um, You know, it's definitely like, it's definitely really, uh, it's not just that it's funny. It's that it's interesting in some of those ways. And it's like, um, well, there's a lot of, for a lot of trans people, uh, risk and being othered and, uh, kind of kind of uh experiencing having lived one way and then if you're out living openly another way there is this sort of uh with, with a lot some people but not all people there's this sort of sardonic sense of humor because a lot of the time it feels like if you're super watched and you you're you're constantly scrutinized you know sometimes it feels like you're living on borrowed time so Mm -hmm. a lot of the time like there's this sort of weird sense of camaraderie with hey everyone fucking hates you too uh so it's it's kind of born from that uh like just the the weird sense of humor where you're saying stuff like that and for for that character we wanted to always sort of have have it be like a I don't know, like a casual sort of relationship where, yeah, you were friends, but maybe you had sex with one another once in a while. I mean, I, that's where I, that's where I kind of float between, uh, Mm -hmm. lately. And I think it was important to kind of, I'm, you know, I'm not obviously not going to share every little bit of the experience, but, uh, it, it seemed, it seems like, I kind of wanted to put that in there because uh, for a lot of trans people, it's it's kind of like how people gravitate towards the cattiness in drag culture, where there there is a definite reason uh, why that's a thing and what it's born from. And so I was kind of letting that be a window into why some of the trans people you may see online have really weird senses of humor hmm. or yeah. where you're just making casual allusions to self mutilation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just like, it definitely, it definitely worked for me in that, in that moment, but also really like throughout the, the, um, the story. I mean, like there's other places where it's like not, you know, like not something in humor. Like you have a scene where the main character, who I should just mention to the listeners because they may not have read it yet. Like the main character, the protagonist is not named right in the story. And that's like sort of a important, important piece of it, an important decision. But anyway, where, where she's like looking around the room and, you know, like she's, like she's uh, doing 
she's has a, she's with a John and she's looking around the room and figuring out like, what can she weaponize if she has to? And, um, you know, that's like not an exclusive experience to people who are doing that kind of work, frankly. Right. But, um, mm-hmm. right. But well, it, yeah, yeah. Uh, if it, again, it was also sort of why I mentioned that I didn't use vetting services. So I, it was always kind of like, okay, uh, I should probably know how to get out of this building and just kind of look around and, you know, maybe make sure someone knows I've been gone, et cetera. I mean, even if it, it, you know, God forbid implicates you in a crime, it's also just like, well, I don't want to be implicated in a death. So yeah, it was kind of, it's kind of where that comes from. Hmm. I mean, I, I also think like one of the really big themes from this, uh, from, from the book is also like social class in terms of like what kind of work is available to people and how they relate to other characters um, in the story as well. Um, I, I think that there's like, even though, you know, comics sort of came up being a very working class medium in terms of the people who were making it and in terms of a big chunk of the audience, I think there's very few stories now that really address you know, working class or low income people about like their lived lives and experiences and the kind of jobs that they do. And, you know, your the character here is doing factory work and, and then she's doing, you know, sex work as well. Um, and she's doing call center work, which is like, you know, call center work is like brutal and very, very low pay and exhausting. Um, and, you know, so you actually are like looking at the kinds of jobs that people are, are doing, like was, was, writing about social class really important in, in, in the story for you? Well, uh, in terms of, in terms of it being a direct decision, uh, it was, it was more, it was more tying to, uh, the, the greater theme of, you know, work and, and how people interact with it. And certainly class does, play a part and you can see, okay, how bosses interact and relative to something and even in a way, the way Johns do, but, uh, is it, was it a deliberate decision? Uh, it was more me trying to look at where jobs I had done and also try to get this idea uh, out of people's heads where neoliberalism is basically fucking that and YouTube. YouTube has basically <laughs> given people this modified version of dementia where uh, because some loud jackass says it and it has X amount of views, this is this is empirical fact. If anything, uh, it was that, you know, there's this thought associated with people maybe who do sex work or maybe have, I don't know, sold drugs or have done any sort of uh, thing that may be illegal where they're just really lazy people and then they should have tried harder. And, you know, you're just making excuses and, you know, this is capitalism. Uh, in order for someone to succeed, people that – X amount of people that don't really get a choice – this way or that way are going to get fucked over. The fact I'm sitting in a house right now uh, and I've made money doing something is money someone else isn't getting, and that's where we're at. Uh, so for me, it was more, you know, when you say that sex workers aren't real workers, it's 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 really asinine and. I I I don't get it. I I I mean I get it. I I just as easily could have been a hyper conservative person. And even then I thought, you know, there there are people that are like compassionate conservatives where okay, we're all God's children. We're all who among us is without sin and now now it seems to be now it just seems to be like everyone's fucking practicing from the seed faith Bible where if you give X amount of money to this guy and he gets a jumbo jet, uh, 
you've done right by God. It's 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 a bunch of horse shit. Uh, mm-hmm. People people people's work is just universally draining, monotonous crap. Like people are lucky when they get a career and they get to do what they like to do. It's like the exception. It's not the rule. Yeah, I mean, I I really feel like if somebody reads this and they leave not understanding that like sex work is a kind of work and that all kinds of work have, especially when you're not like when you're not the boss, when you don't have a ton of economic privilege, you know, when you're not in a union, like when you don't, you know, all these factors, like it's just it's it's another sort of work and that the emotional labor that folks do when they're doing sex work, you know, is part of why that's work and that that actually can be the really exhausting piece of it a lot of the time like they're not paying attention because I think this does such a beautiful job of conveying all of that to folks so I I think this is definitely successful in that way as well as many other I appreciate it um one of the other, you know, thoughts I just was sort of having is like, I mean, how did you and Remy collaborate in terms of putting it together? Like literally, like you have a script and, and Remy's doing art. Um, did you have a script first? And then, like, like, yeah, like what was the process like? It was conversational. It was basically a lot of Twitter DMs, uh, Skype conversations, and later going into shared Google Docs, and here's what we want. Uh, Here's what Remy, uh, like, can and won't do. And then sort of meeting in the middle, I would basically give her my outline and say, how do you feel about this? We have a conversation. If we were both like, all right, we we like this, we're going to commit to this, and then I would do the script. Remy would uh, sometimes ask for a lot of reference material. So some mm-hmm. of the places and settings uh, in the book are kind of kind of making reference to me going through and being like, okay, I used to live here in Oregon, or here's you know here's Washington in the 1970s when we uh, look at Tom's portion of the story where I would go through and be like, all right, here's kind of that. But I would never, as far as the art goes, there would be very few moments where I would go in and say this or that. The only time I think I made a suggestion I really committed to and was like, can we do this, was uh, near the end where, uh, I mean, I'm it's not really a spoiler uh, per se so yeah. much as it's it's a color choice but basically the the color swatch changes very uh definitively near the end and instead of a sort of fade to black it's more like a fade to blue mm-hmm. which was sort of a very very deliberate decision i I don't think that blue is a necessarily hopeful uh, color, but I wanted melancholy to be the definite takeaway and not like nihilistic, everything is over, all hope is lost. It was just like, okay, something shitty happened, but you're still alive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't know, that's probably, that's probably, <laughs> that's probably the image pitch. You know, this is, oh, well, this was fucking awful, but, uh, you know, you, you got through it. Good I mean, I job. think that one of, the, one of the real themes throughout the story is there's a lot of people who are, like, think that they're trying to help the main character and are not actually doing what she would want anyone to do. They're trying to, like, it's like pa- they're patronizing or they're trying to get her to live a certain way. They're intervening her life. And, and in the end, your character, even though she's, like not she hasn't like reached her dreams or whatever like she has insisted on her own terms of what she will and won't do um and it's like led her to the position to the position that she's in but it's something that she's done autonomously and yeah it's not like you know and and she's still here she's still standing you know she's still 
self-defining herself, you know? Yeah, uh, that was, that was kind of, that was like a, a real decision I was facing was like, okay, obviously going back home feels like it's going to be a death sentence, but you know, it was that or homelessness. And if I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose on my terms. And, you know, I, I think that for me, it just meant, okay, I'm, I'm going back to the, the state I'm native to, and I'm going to throw as much time as I can into getting out of here. And, you know, uh, not the characters sort of epilogue, but mine was that, you know, okay, obviously I have no control over how crazy, uh, things turn out to be. I mean, maybe I did or didn't, I don't want to get into all of that, but you know, there was only so much I could do and I've tried to turn a negative into a positive and, you know, I would have rather had gotten into writing and comics in a much different way. But that said, uh, uh, I'm happy where I'm at now. And I don't know. Uh, I think that, I think that doing something is much better than just resigning yourself to, uh, to the idea that, you know, there's, there's nothing you can do. And, you know, what it, it would be incredibly easy to just, you know, have had a sugar daddy do this or that, have GRS taken care of. But at that point you're, you're bought, mm -hmm. you know, someone, you're someone else's, you're, you're not your own. Uh, everything that's happened to me has been awful. It's not going to go away. It's always going to basically mark me, but you know, it's mine. Uh, I think at, at, at my best, uh, I, I can just warn people to not make the mistakes I've made. Uh, but you know, I survived, and uh, I was the only person that could <laughs> get through it the way I did, and I have. So that that's where I'm at. I mean, I I think it's really important, like that this is you know a, a story that's like by you know, a, you know a trans creative team, and is representing it from that perspective because there's just you see a lot of art in general sort of trying to talk about the trans experience that's not actually by trans people in the slightest and like how much that's like ridiculous that people think that they can talk about that particular part of the, you know, of someone's life without like living that. I, I, yeah. I think this is a really great example of like what they're increasingly calling now in critical space, like an own voices story of like somebody who is, who has dealt with some of these, you know, like who's, of, I, I, God, I hate to use never demographic, but like who's from the demographic? Uh, um, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, the person, the the people it directly affects. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and, you know, I, and I, I, we definitely like. I think like this is the only way that like you know the story can really be told was by like you know was by like you and by Remy. Um, I mean, and not just because it's like a personal story in those ways, but just because even the fact that it is like a slice of life comic about a trans woman, um, I think it's just necessary completely. I mean, I would say that I don't think, I don't, I don't think that cis people should avoid telling uh, narratives where transness is something that's explored. I think one of the best parts about art is trying to understand difference and explore self and explore identity. Uh, that said, in the same token, 
you are also not what you eat. You can consume something, but that doesn't mean you are something, if that makes sense. You know, uh, I think that even being adjacent, you have to take pains to also listen to and cite the people of that experience if it's going to be authentic or real, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. You're going to, if you... If you just uh, if you just throw out like a bunch of con- contextual cues, like whether it be involving gay experience or say black experience or Latino experience, without the cultural context, you're you're not really going to be telling an authentic story. You're going to be basically playing the Big Bang Theory with people's fucking life experiences and bookending it with a bazinga. It's <laughs> going to be awful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. I think that's like a great way to explain it. Um, well, we're, ra- we're wrapping up with the hour in a little bit. You know, I would love to hear, like, you know, I know it takes a great amount of work and planning and strategy to put together um, a graphic novel, but do you of other projects that you're looking to to move doing in the near future that we should, if, you know, whether it's essay, comic, anything, anything else. Well, right now I'm working on extinction level event with uh, artist Coffee. Uh, it's on hiatus right now, but it's much different from the pervert. It's basically genre fiction where we have this uh, kind of anthropomorphic dog character, but. He's the only one of his kind on Earth, or so he thinks, and he's basically declaring war on Earth uh, and is working to kill everybody on Earth that's human. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> that is rather different. Uh, Funny you should say. Um, and that's it, is, on it is not the pervert at all. No. That, and that, that's on Patreon, it looks like? Yep. And... Uh, Patreon slash Extinction, I believe. Um I am I'm also in the planning stages for working on a novel with a uh, longtime friend of mine, Samantha Allen, who uh, works at the Daily Beast and is a oh. uh, is a award winning essayist and uh, all around writer, PhD holder, Kinsey Fellow. She's the smartest person I know, and I say all of this shit like I'm introducing a boxer, but uh, <laughs> she she has an impressive slate of experience, and we're working on a uh, mystery novel. Oh, right interesting. Huh. Yeah. Huh. Do you feel like you would – sorry, the ice cream man is doing his thing. Um, do you feel like you would have interest in – doing other sort of slice of life work or work that sort of draws some autobiography in the future, or is it like just really exhausting and vulnerable and not something that you'd be interested in going back to? Uh, if I did, there are caveats. One, mm-hmm. uh, we would not, I think the only time I'm ever going to explore characters from the pervert again is after more talking with Remy and it would only be the Edna and Tom characters and it wouldn't mm. be an ongoing thing. Uh, and I feel like this isn't a conflict-based thing. This is a way Remy works thing. I have gotten the question of what, when me and Remy are going to work together again. And if we ever did, it would not be uh, for for many years. We are both very busy right now, and uh, it there's just a lot of... Uh, There's like a lot of, I don't want to say personal conflicts, but I would say scheduling and work-based conflicts. Uh, I'm in the U.S., she's in the U.K., et cetera. Uh, Yeah, that's that's quite a a big one. (laughs) As far as autobio stuff, uh, yes, but I would say that um, in comic form, We'll see. 
Uh, it's not that I'm running from comics so much as I'm trying to do a lot of different stuff right now. Right now I'm trying to work on the novel debut with Sam, and we'll see uh, cautiously. I, 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 I'm not done with comics by a long shot, but I'm going to explore genre fiction, and will I do autobio again? It's, it's something I'm interested in, but uh, not enough to say anything definitive. That's totally fine. Yeah, I got it, you know. I, I think that there's always also just a question of like, you don't want to get necessarily pegged to one particular genre or, or style. And, you know, your, your career is young yet as it were, but, um, but I want to thank you again for, for creating this and for like telling your story. And, and um, you know, I, I, I don't think that there's anything else like it on the stand right now. I think it's really powerful and um, completely absorbing where can our listeners uh, follow you on the internet to uh, stay up with your awesomeness and your creative output? I am M Perez writes IRL on Twitter. And uh, there's a link to my Tumblr portfolio in aforementioned uh, Twitter bio. Yeah. I'm, I've mm-hmm. kind of pared down, I've pared down some of the uh, sites I've used and have kind of switched up, my Tumblr. Uh, I think I'm in a phase of my career where, while well, yes, I'm, I was at one point really into exhibitionism. Now it's just like, I'm going to focus more on my work. So it, mm. it might be, it might be more safe for work than people who have been long time friends and followers might know. So that said, yeah, that, that's where you can find me online. No, that's, and that's helpful too. Like I, you know, I, my, my, for example, my social media persona is stuff that I use for my, my job, you know, and I work in like left-wing political stuff, but it's not the same as like, I don't know, like being an artist and you can just like do whatever. Um, so there's always these questions of like, you know, what are the things that you can do or say or write online and representing yourself versus being able to just like be creative and share whatever you want. And yeah, that's always such an interesting question about like what goes on your, like what kind of things do you tweet? And that's also true for this comic as well. Like how personal or how specific do you get when it comes to yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to stop being a loud mouth, but uh, I'm going to refine the ways in which I am a loud mouth because I'm, I'm just now becoming aware of like, I guess how reactionaries, latch on to outspoken people and I'm kind of, mm-hmm. you know, it's all a learning process. And for the most part, I'm right now, I just want people to focus on the work and that's what I've been about lately. So it's, uh, it's all choices I made, which feels that much better than like someone wagging a finger at you saying, this is what you can't say. That's what's been nice about working with image. No one has, no one has browbeat me or said, what did you say? How dare you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's been nice. Uh, but yeah, those are the places you can uh, hit me up. Well, thanks so much for joining us. And um, for our listeners, I'm going to try to cut together to get rid of my weird, awkward silence. That's entirely my technical fault for being an idiot. Uh, and Michelle, I really appreciate your time and appreciate your work. And um, for folks who want to, uh, or download the podcast to share in the future. It's going to be up on our iTunes in a little while. It's going to be at graphicpolicy.com, of course. Um, happy to get folks' thoughts, feedback, questions. Uh, I'll tweet up some links around organizations that are fighting to combat the damage being done by SESTA because definitely there's amazing sex worker organizations who are, you know, not taking this shit lying down and are making sure that you know, people are looking out for each other and are going to push to make sure that the law doesn't get implemented in this way, et cetera. Um, but anyway, so, uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter at E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn. Obviously, Graphic Policy is Graphic Policy and GraphicPolicy.com. Um, we will be back next week. I am not sure what our topic is yet, but it will be awesome, and you should join us. And as we like to say, keep it geeky.
Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.